I think with me it was like I already was very technical because I was playing indoor, I was playing liver there and also setter. And just because I started very early, I think I had a good technique and a very good ball control. I also, when I got older, I, I like between 15 and 20 years old, I became very fast and I started to jump very high. Before I didn't jump so high, but when I got 15, 16, 17, I started to jump very high. So that just came naturally from, from training and from, from doing sports every day. But what I really focused on, I think, was to just finding different ways to be successful or different ways to score, different ways to stop the other team. So really thinking in a different way about the, the game than just uh, about my attack. Okay, I have to attack hard or I have to, I have to attack high or the line has, has to be very precise. I focus more on how can I beat the defender? How can I beat the blocker? Or how can I trick them so that I defend them? Hello, 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 everybody. And we will get started with Alexander Huber versus Australia. Brandon, can you hear us? I uh, can. Man. How are you, man? I'm freaking good, man. How are you? <laughs> I'm freaking good, too. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Did you get your workout in today? I did. Today was a little bit, uh, I, I forgot how tough those uh, animal flow movements are. <laughs> the, um, the I haven't done them. those in so long, so that definitely uh, got me working a little bit harder than I was uh, anticipating, nice. especially for like the warm up. Yeah. But yeah, and then I kind of made do with some stuff. I was stepping off of chairs and and then making sure I don't hit my head on Luckily we have somewhat of a high ceiling, so. Good creativity. Um, yeah, I was doing the depth jumps and everything, but yeah, not a bad start to the morning. Nice. How about you? Yeah, I did the workout last night. Like I said, I, I restarted the whole preseason program. So 60 days looking ahead. And I've been doing the workouts, but I've been like really writing them down and timing them so that like everybody, we have 135 members in the uh, strength training program now, which is insane. That's awesome. So I've been like writing everything down so that uh, we can come out with like a big kind of 2.0 so that everybody can see the timing of each exercise, each workout and everything like that. But yeah, it feels good to get back on a rhythm and know that like, all right, every day I got my workout for today and it's set up for me. And now like, I'm, we're not gonna have to alter any of the exercises because we're not in season. Like when we were practicing, right it was tough to keep that energy but now that we're not like on the beach we don't have to share it and we could go hard at that off-season program so yeah it's pretty cool yeah i like your video whatever day it was now where you showed like the alternate ways of doing like squats with bands and one thing i hadn't thought of was the deadlifts with the bands and like putting it around your feet and then pulling up that's how i did day one yesterday was squats deadlifts and then step ups and so like i have like the normal like big green band and then the purple bands and stuff like that all like the full length uh, exercise bands cool and i was able to do like the green and the purple to do the squats and then i would like i before i had done it but i just did the same kind of thing where i put the strap over my neck and tried to do deadlifts like that but it turned more into like almost like a good morning or like a rdl type lift yeah. dude doing the rdls just with the heavy band strapped under your foot is golden oh yeah like i i woke up this morning just doing with yesterday with bands my legs and my hamstrings especially are actually a little sore so cool this is becoming just a regular thing and we're so fired up to be able for like me and brandon to be able to learn from the world's like absolute best players. So first of all, we had the, the second ever female beach volleyball gold medalist, Carrie Pothurst last week. That was awesome. She's now a motivational speaker. So we picked up like mind organization, performance tricks. And we had Damien Schumann, who's the top defender in Australia. We had Sam Pedlow, the top blocker in, in Canada and ranked number 15 in the world. Who else have we had? Uh, Casey Patterson. Casey Patterson, who's, you know, somewhere around there. <laughs> <laughs> the best trash talker in the world. Yes, top trash talker in the world. And this week, 
we have Zandy Huber, who is from Austria. He's been like one of their top two defenders now for five, six, seven years, and another Olympian. And then tomorrow, we have Sarah Pavan, who is the world's best female beach volleyball player and has been for a significant amount, amount of time. Like everybody talks about the, the Norwegian <coughs> kids and how dominating they are, but like the amount of tournaments that Sarah and Mel have won is unreal. And we got them tomorrow. Yeah. Like, this is such an awesome time to be learning from such unbelievable volleyball minds. So. Yeah, it's really cool. And like you said before, I love it because yes, we're hosting it, but I feel like I'm taking in just as much as the audience is, which is, it's really, really cool. And I mean, especially, and it's cool because a lot of, most of the people we've had on, we have personal connections with, and we know how amazing they are as people. And so it's pretty cool to just allow everyone else to kind of get to see that. Like, I know I, I met Zandy last year when he was out here and we got to train with him. Wait, and he's another just... Olympian came to Hermosa Beach, California, <laughs> to train beach volleyball? That's right. crazy. I wish somebody would set up a camp so that everybody could see all of these Olympians <laughs> on one beach. Wouldn't that be an amazing company? That would be a good idea. I wonder if people would like that, like coming to Paradise for a week and getting to like not only get trained by great coaches but also get to watch like professional coach professional players and teams train probably not dude that idea would never work yeah, no one would like have a good time sounds like it's a bad idea we should just keep it for ourselves hey guys as funny as that is guys maybe you don't know us maybe this is your first time being introduced to us but brendan and i have a company called volley camp hermosa where we do exactly that we run classes private lessons training every day in hermosa beach which is the mecca of beach volleyball and we have seven day training camps where people can stay in one click. You got your hotel and you got unlimited coaching and training for seven days. Once all this mess is gone, we want you to come back to Hermosa and uh, Zandy can tell you a little bit more once he comes on. But Zandy Huber, so we've got a match. We talked with Damien and we talked with Flo, who are both defenders who played against Alexander. And apparently, Zandy is short for Alexander in Austrian German. So maybe he'll tell us about that too. And yeah, he's been one of the top defenders in Austria for a significant amount of time. And he is 2016 Rio Olympian. I want to hear about that and what his path was. He knocked out our boys, Casey Patterson and Jake Gibb, knocked them out of the Olympics. So also interested in what he's got to say about that. Because there was like this little bit of drama where Casey Patterson essentially stormed off uh, the court after getting knocked out of the Olympics, which for me, I totally understand because it's like, hey, here's everything you ever dreamed of in your life. Here's what you've been working for for your entire life. And somebody rips that out of your hands and that happened to be Zandy. And now you're supposed to be like a nice guy. <laughs> yeah, so I want to see how like tough. people react when, you know, somebody burns their coffee first thing in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> and most, uh, maybe not the most impressive part, but one of the impressive parts about him is that he's only 5'10". So he's 182 centimeters, 181 centimeters, and he's getting this done against people who are like 210 centimeters, 6'9", 6'10", 7 foot, and he's got himself to the Olympics for this. Do you have anything for him? Because I got a whole bag. Uh, no, I, I'm really interested to see how his mind works. Um, I know last year when I got, I, I trained with him a couple times when you weren't there and I got to be on his team. And it's just one of those guys that makes playing not only fun, but also just super easy. Like he would just give me these little pointers. And the next thing I know, he'd be behind me scooping up balls without a doubt. So I'm, I'm just excited to see what he has to say and see how he's doing. I miss wow. him. So uh, without further ado, Alexander, there he is. Uh, uh, sunshine, sunshine. Can you hear me? We can hear you. We're gonna Can't see you. Go. Oh, I think we can. I'm there he is. This, sorry. <laughs> there he is. Welcome to town, buddy. Welcome, welcome, thanks. welcome. How's thanks it going? For nice, thanks for the nice introduction. <laughs> <laughs> Of course. So we had to do 12 o'clock our time because you had to put your, your kids to bed. Right. Tell us, you know, without getting too in depth, we don't want to make you uncomfortable and introduce your family, but how many kids do you have? Where do you live? 
and um, we'll start there. I'm, I live in Frankfurt. I have two wonderful kids. They're four and two years old. As everybody with kids knows, in the evening is the crunch time, as I call it. It can get a little wild, let's say it like this. I couldn't do it earlier. Now they're in bed and sleeping, so no time. Uh, most people want to know, like early on, most people want to know when you started playing beach volleyball. Did you play indoor first? And that's it. Like, so tell us when you first started playing beach volleyball. I started indoors, obviously. I played in a, in a club, all the junior tournaments um, and championships in Austria. Mm -hmm. And my father was working for the Austrian Volleyball Federation at that time when I was young. He was one of the first guys in Austria to recognize beach volleyball. Uh, when I was really young, I don't remember, maybe I was seven, eight years old. He gave me a beach wall ball to my birthday as a present. And so that was my first contact with the beach wall ball. I had seven years old? Uh, probably seven, eight years. And I hadn't seen beach wall ball before. I hadn't known the sport, although I was playing wall ball already uh, mm -hmm. since I was, I was five. And I got this new ball. And one or two years later, he took me to Italy, Lignano. It was one of the first World Tour events in, uh, in Central Europe at that time. And uh, yeah, he took me down there. It's only two and a half hours by car from us. I got to watch my first World Tour action of Beach Volvo. I immediately became a big fan of, of Sinjin Smith, who was playing that time. And yeah, from then on, I put up a net in our garden and we played Beach Volvo all summer long with my brothers. Uh, Zane, I was actually talking to my roommate last night. His name's Jake Rosner. Oh, yeah. And he was telling, he's like, wait, you're talking to Zane anymore? And I guess you guys played on um, the same professional team in, in Austria at some point? Yeah. yeah, right. And he was saying that your dad was the coach Possible. or was a part of it? <laughs> he's the, he was the, the manager or the boss of the, of the club. He, he has always been. So, yeah, that's how I came to volleyball. He, he was kind of owning the club. So I was joining trainings very early. <laughs> and I think at the time Jake was playing with us. He wasn't the coach anymore. He was okay. coaching before and after, but he was the manager. Yeah, and, and Jake was, was on my team in, in Frankfurt. He says hello. Uh, he hopes you're doing well. <laughs> Thanks. I'm doing well. Say hello back to him. Yeah, I will. I will. Hey, I wasn't able to pull up your match against the Norwegians. Yeah, it would have been awesome. But what I did pull up was kind of something that we've been talking about the last two weeks, your last World Tour tournament in Cambodia. So I was able to get that. And the people who have been coming to these webinars regularly, they've seen a bunch of those matches from that tournament. So it's going to be interesting because we had Damien talk about his match against you. And so now we get the reverse side of the net and, uh, and what it feels like on the other side. But before we get into that, I just want to ask you a few questions. These are questions. We're going to call it a lightning round. And you just have to go for your first answers, whatever it comes for. All right, ready? Okay. All right. Would you rather be taller or jump higher? Jump higher. Would you rather be a, your partner? Would you, as a partner, would you rather have them be a great passer or a great setter? Great setter. Would you rather your partner be a great server or a great blocker? Great blocker. Would you rather a taller partner or a partner who jumps higher? Taller. Do you like to pass low or pass high? Choose pass one. low. Set low or set high? Set low. Is it better to be athletic or smart? Smart. Is it better to be technical or athletic? Technical. With all of your other stats, as they are right now, would you rather side out at 60% or get three aces per set? Three aces per set. Would you rather side out at 60% or get eight digs per set? At least get eight digs per set already, so i say side out at 60%. <laughs> Okay. Lift fast or lift heavy? Lift heavy. How many times do you lift in preseason? Four to five times a week. How many times do you lift in during season? Two to three times a week. All right. Most important lower body exercise? Uh, deadlift. Most important upper body exercise? Chin-ups. Pick a partner of the opposite sex. It's a tough one. It's not a lightning round anymore, right? No. <laughs> <laughs> Terrible. And what is your dinner the night before game day? It depends where I'm playing at. It was mostly rice. <laughs> <laughs> if you had a choice of all the food in the world? I would uh, choose potatoes and chicken. And what is your breakfast on game day? Uh, usually eggs. Eggs, that's it? Flat eggs? Psh, bump. Yeah, eggs with a little bit of bread. Uh, it depends w what the hotel offers or whatever I can get. I need eggs. <laughs> I like it. Okay, what statistic 
So what number and do you think separates the teams on Sunday, the championship teams, from the Friday teams? What's the difference maker? Service pressure. Service pressure. It's, I like it's it. It's hard to, to put a stat on it, but I think it's service pressure. Okay. Hmm. What player did you or do you watch to learn from? I watched a lot of Stinson Smith when I was young. Now I, I really like Nikolai Lupo as a team. And right now, obviously, the Norwegians are the, the team to watch. <laughs> cool. All right. And lastly, who is the most frustrating player to play against? For me, in my career, it has been Bruno, Bruno Schmidt. Bruno, the defender. Yeah, yeah. I just couldn't side out against him. He ducked yeah. all my balls, so it was really tough against him. Interesting that it wasn't a blocker for you, mm -hmm. yeah. that, you, that yeah. you chose another defender. All my career, it was always, I was more, let's say, scared. Or I had more respect of a good defender playing against me than a good blocker. I kind of knew better how to work against a good blocker than against a good defender. All right. Well, so that being said, guys, we are going to put some links here because I want to make sure that you are following Alexander, that you are following us. So I've given our Instagram accounts and our YouTube accounts. But Zandy, do you have the link to your YouTube account and to your Instagram? So while yes. we're here, guys, take one minute. Please just give us a follow or a subscribe. It helps us so much more than you know when we need sponsors, uh, when we're looking to companies and we're saying, look how many people follow this sport and pay attention. If you're not subscribed to us on YouTube or you're not following us on Instagram, please do that. We are putting everybody's handles below. X marks the beach is Zandy. And he is also going to get uh, his YouTube channel, the Austrian Training Center. And could you just tell us, before we start the video analysis, could you tell us a little bit about your training center in Austria? Yeah, in Austria, it has always been like the federation. They were centralizing everybody in Vienna. As I have been living in Frankfurt, I was looking for a way to train in Frankfurt. So I was building their nice little training center. We got the one indoor beach court that is very important in Austria in winter. We have some good uh, gym facilities and to here I always invited other teams to come and join me for the preparation for the season. And this little training center kept growing and kept getting better. And right now we are five, between five and six professional teams training there, right on the limit of our capacity because we only have one indoor court. Yeah, and it's, it's really fun. We have a lot of young teams here. It's first of all great to see them improve every week, every month. And uh, second so you, of all, you train juniors there? Also, yeah. Two, okay, you train two, juniors. Two. Can like an average player, like if, if I like uh, am a B player, you know, I'm, I'm just a hobby player, can I like go to this city in Austria and can I get court time? Sure. Everybody can come and train. It's just the, the support, like the, the coaches cost, um, cost money, the indoor court cost money. So the level of support you're getting depends on the level of your... So guys, if now you've got a bunch of connections around the world, right? So if you're at our last webinar, you have all of Damien Schumann's information if you're going to Australia, right? Here, Zandi is inviting you to his court that he trains on in Austria. So if you're heading there, go ahead, give him a ring. And his Instagram is right here. If you have any plans on traveling to Europe for anything or you think you might in the future, why not just go follow him so that you can be reminded and be like, ah, oh, you know what? While I'm vacationing, let me get some coaching from an Olympian. Let me go train where all of like the best players in Austrian shape. So Michelle is asking, what is the name of the facility? Let's type it in here, Sandy. Yeah. So pretty cool. And like I said, um, you know, we seem sometimes like professional athletes can seem like they're somewhat untouchable, but every one of them so far that we've had on has invited you to contact them, get in touch for coaching training. And he is at Sport Park in Klagenfurt, which for years was the, far and away, the best tournament in the world. And it's just a great town, a fun town. It's a university town, right? Uh, yeah, university, a small, tiny little town, but directly at the lake mountains within 10 minutes so right now we're having like spring weather really warm almost like summer and still i can see the snow on the mountains from my balcony really beautiful here really great great spot to for holidays here at the lake it's really worth coming all right 
So guys, uh, yeah, write down those Instagrams, click on them, save them, follow us, subscribe to us. It helps us out more than you know, so that we can keep providing these free webinars and coaching. The people can just text me or text uh, to at Lindbom Sport on Instagram if they need any information about the training center, about the possibilities of training here in Frankfurt. And I'm also happy to give tips and uh, recommendations for a holiday in Frankfurt. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Putting his Instagram right there so that people who are watching on their computer can go on their phone and follow. What do you say? Let's get into this. I want to talk a little bit about offense with you. For those of you guys who don't know, Alexander is five foot ten. How tall is that in centimeters? 179, but shrinking with the time. Now that I get older, it's, it gets less and less. I think I'm shrinking too, buddy. Um, I think like as you as you get better at the sport, you also get smaller. You know, okay. like when you're first coming out, you're like, oh, I'm six six, and then it's like you win a couple tournaments, and you're like, yeah, I'm six four. <laughs> <laughs> I know when, when when I was young, it yeah, it was kind of tough for me that I was one of the small players. So I was really trying to be as tall as possible with all the testings that I had to do for whatever, for the national teams and, and so on. And I really wrote down in an old book that I found just uh, now, my highest ever measured size, and it was 179.8 centimeters. I, I, didn't, I didn't crack the 180. So. <laughs> ah, you're so close. Yeah. A few more vegetables. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So what was something that you told yourself that you needed to be good at? Did you let your height into your head during playing? Did you tell yourself as a smaller player who is playing in like something where you're looking at yourself going, most people are going to tell me that I'm too short to play this game and be successful. So what did you tell yourself? And if there are any smaller players out there who are just getting started, who think that they need more height, what would you tell them? I think that for me, it was kind of a good thing that people didn't believe in me because I developed the, the attitude that w when someone was saying, ah, this guy, he will never make it to the professional beach uh, he ne will never be successful in the world tour. I had this strong feeling in, in, in myself that I want to prove him wrong. And so this was a, a very, very big motivation for me always. The, the most important thing I can tell people, no matter if you're small or big, it's in beach world war, really, you should never give up because uh, it needs time. It needs, you need some more chances, some more tries to, to get successful in beach world war. Only few players come on the scene and are successful right away. Most of the players, they need some tries in qualification or whatever. Mm -hmm. And it's important not to give up. Yeah. Yeah. We talked about that with Sam Pedlo, who said that, you know, the, the one year that he started playing with Grant, he lost in eight qualifiers eight yeah. qualifiers in a row yeah. and then like on his ninth he won and then beyond that right after that he never took less than a ninth in the rest of his yeah. tournaments for that year yeah. so it shows that like yeah there's years and like weeks months and years that you need to push as a smaller player would you say that you focused more on speed more on jumping or more on technique than anybody else like how what did you think you needed more of did you say i have to jump as high as possible or i need to be so much more technical than the other players or was um, there something different i think with me it was like i already was very technical because i was playing indoor i was playing liver there and also setter and just because i started very early i think i had a good technique and a very good ball control i also when i got older i, I like between 15 and 20 years old I became very fast and I started to jump very high. Before I didn't jump so high, but when I got 15, 16, 17, I started to jump very high. So that just came naturally from training and from, from doing sports every day. But what I really focused on, I think, was to just finding different ways to be successful or different ways to score, different ways to stop the other team. So really thinking in a different way about the, the game uh, than just uh, about my um, attack. Okay, I have to attack hard or I have to, I have to attack high or the line shed has to be very precise. I focus more on how can I beat the defender? How can I beat the blocker? Or how can I trick them so that I defend them and stuff like that. So we will get into the share here. I'm gonna share my screen so that we can go through this. I want you to introduce this match. What did this mean to you? 
who were you playing against and uh, what was your strategy or mindset going into it? This was the final of the Cambodia two star this year. And last year we won the, we won the two star tournament in Cambodia. And this year it was again our first tournament. So we didn't really know what it will be like, like how we are in shape. Like first tournament, it's always a little bit of insecurity. And so it was within the tournament, we really improved from match to match and we fought our way uh, back into the finals in Cambodia. And I really, really, really wanted to repeat here in Cambodia. And I mean, generally, I hate to lose finals. <laughs> it was a, a very important match for us, obviously. And I tried to really get a good start and be very focused from the beginning. Our opponents were the Australians, Schumann, McHugh. In my opinion, a very, very, very strong team. They just started uh, together again, so they didn't have a lot of tournaments together in this period or before this tournament. But they but they had three or four years of experience playing together before that. So yeah, yeah, yeah. even though they were new here, they had played yeah. together for a solid yeah, year. Yeah. Years. But I was hoping that they weren't sharp already together again. Mm -hmm. So, on the other hand, the week before they, they won the Asian Championships. So, yeah, we knew it, it, it would be a, a tough match. And with the Australians, they have a very unique style of play. They hit a lot of second balls, they push the sets out and try to move the block a lot. And mm, so, knowing that, I think our main focus was to to try to avoid that. So try to make it hard for them to play the uh, side of them too, and try to make it hard for them to play all their combination settings. Okay, so Australia, just to, just to recap, Australia is a team that likes to attack on two on the second ball. And then they like to throw these kind of big outside sets to the pins. Like they want to get your defense moving, right? Yeah. That's like, they want to confuse you, change up what you do. And you yeah. said that you're trying to, when you're serving or you're on defense, you want to stop them from doing that. What is one way to stop a team from going on to? First of all, deep serves make it harder. So deep if you serves. serve deep, yeah. If you serve in deep, it's hard for them to push the ball all the way in front and have find a good timing for attack. And uh, the second part is when you serve the middle, it gets also harder because if you serve the middle, either they have to open up all the way to the antenna or they, they send the ball uh, in a sharp angle in front to the net so it's hard to attack the, the second ball. So that were the two strategies that we had in the beginning. Okay, so and correct me, correct me if I'm wrong, but when I'm thinking, because I use that same strategy too, if, if there's like somebody who likes to hit on two or they're a big threat, I like to serve them high and deep because again, correct me if, if this is not what you're thinking of, but when I think about serving deep, I used to think about it like six years ago. I used to think about it as the ball needs to land in the back part of the court. But now I think about it as I need, like if this, if this person is passing right here, I need this ball to go over where their platform would be so that they actually have to move back because a fast flat serve that lands deep doesn't have the same effect as a high rainbow serve that actually forces them to tomahawk or move their feet to the back line. So when you say deep serve, do you mean like high rainbow serve or do you mean hard and fast? I think we try to do something in between. Um, I think you're absolutely right. If you serve sharp, it would just cut off the ball and don't, don't have to move at all. So you have to serve it high enough, but also with a little bit of pressure so that they have to move and have a difficult time to control the ball. Okay, so you're thinking about high deep and you're thinking about middle to stop them from going on to. Let's look at your defense for a while and then we'll talk uh, about, about your offense as we get into it. I noticed that they're serving your partner, but let's get uh, into your... Okay, so your partner's serving. Do you know what you were thinking against Australia? Like how you would play them defensively? You don't have to give everything away about your strategy. But so defensively, you're thinking stop them from going on two. And then were you going line, cross, threes, fours, mixing it up? We were blocking mostly line. And we knew that they are mostly hitting hard. Okay. So I wasn't really paying attention to shots. I was focusing on the hard swings. And uh, yeah, we tried, we, we tried to 
take away their line because when they when they push out the sets to the antenna, uh, they obviously banking on the blocker being late and trying to go line a lot. So okay. we try to really be quick out there uh, with the block and stop them from doing that. And I try to cover the, the cross court. And depending on how the set was flying and the position of the attacker to the ball, I was adjusting my position. Okay. If so, what changes in your mind or your body or your posture when you say I'm focusing on hard driven instead of shots? Like, do you stand a different way? Do you stand a different place? Do you move to a different place later or sooner? I stay. I stand on a different place, obviously, and. This the place it depends on the directions the, the hitter is using uh, for most of his attacks. Some hitters they like to hit a sharper angle, some hitters like to go deep cross court, some hitters often hit cross court but to the, more to the middle. If, if I'm playing only for the hard hit, I go into this position and try to be stable there. Also, tendentionally, it's not always the, the, the case, but mostly I stay, I would say I stay a little bit more deep if I'm only going only for the hard hit. If I'm also paying attention for the shots, I step up just a little bit so that I have the same distance to all shots. If you're in front just a little bit, you're, yeah, you have almost the same distance to the cut shot and to the line shot. Okay. So, all right. So when you're playing for, if you're playing against a shooter, somebody who likes to hit softballs everywhere, you step closer to the net and I guess a little bit more towards the middle of the court so that it's really easy to just step and lay out. And if you yeah. know that you're playing against a banger, somebody who just likes to rip, you think your mind says, all right, where do they like to hit their favorite shot? And I'm gonna stand deep and in that area. So you're not worried about like, are you worried about him seeing you if he's a hitter? Do you move late into that spot or do you sit there early? Depending on the player, and here comes the crew, if, if I know he's shooting a lot, playing soft shots a lot, I need to fake him so that he doesn't see me or that he doesn't know where I'm going. If I know he's mostly hitting hard, I need to fake him so that he will go in the direction of the blocker. So I try to, how do you say, I try to get him to hit into the direction of my blocker. So okay. that's, if I fake, that's my, that's my job if he's hitting hard. But, I'm obviously faking less if he's only hitting hard. I like that. Is this something that, did you notice that people were hitting, obviously you played well in this tournament, um, making it to the finals. Did you notice that most teams were hitting hard or was that an individual thing that you picked up on the Australian team? Very individual. Like really every team is different. And I think especially on the two star, one star level, maybe three star two, there are a lot of teams that uh, play more with soft shots, while when you go into the higher levels, like four star and five star, I think most of the players choose their hard swing as their first option. But hmm. just before in the in the semifinal against Flo, we talked to uh, last week, or I don't know, uh, and also in the, in the quarterfinal, we played against players that uh, like to shoot or play soft shots a lot. So guys, in case you don't follow our YouTube channel, which would be a mistake, Long ago, before me and Zandy ever played each other and before we really knew each other, uh, I filmed one of his matches from the side because I was tired of arguing with people about pass and set height. So I wanted to see how high above the antenna people were passing and setting, but I ended up getting a lot of really awesome clips. I did add this link to the YouTube video, but I just want to show you what Zandy's, when he's talking about the fakes. So I'm going to show you guys this video and, and you can watch it again on YouTube, but he says that he's trying to trick a defender into hitting at him. So I do but just want to show this one. According to his stats, but probably a bit smaller, maybe five, nine, five, ten in, uh, in real life. So anyway, he gets this nice float serve and we could talk about that a lot, but um, a lot of indoor techniques use this. It has a left. Sorry, yeah, I'll fast forward do, it but just he a little approaches bit. Approaches low into his jump. Lot, yeah. And then this is the meat of what we're getting into today. Um, I want to talk about this juke that happens right here. So, Huber here ends up running a four, which means that he is showing cross and going to the line. 
but he does it in a really advanced way. So I'll let you watch it and we'll see if you can pick up on it first. And he goes and gets the stick. Now there's a lot into what's happening through this movement. So if you can see, he does a juke first and then he goes to the line. So a lot of people will juke in one direction and we'll see it right here. So juke in one direction so that you think they're running to line, but then they'll just stay in the cross, right? And then he would end up having some oil loves just hit a nice easy ball into his lap. But what he does here, because he's playing at such a high level and he knows that the offense can see him and is paying attention to him because he's playing against some of the best offenses in the world, is he does a double juke. So he intentionally shows, really early, shows that he's going to line, all right? And then he comes back and sits in this cross for a second which tells the hitter, if he does it right, tells the hitter, oh man, what a terribly early fake. I'm not gonna fall for that. I'm still gonna go for the high line. And then he runs down to that high line. So I'm not sure. <laughs> like, you know, I He's was- Giving away I, all your secrets. <laughs> yeah, I was studying you before you even knew that I was studying you. Um, <laughs> but I was like super, super impressed with your ability to do that and for sure I would not have known like what that looked like years ago and that you could have two fakes in one move. Did you have anything to add to what I just saw? Is that what you were thinking or were you just like going crazy? Like maybe I made that up that you were doing it. It looked, <laughs> it looked really intentional. Yeah, when I, I saw that video when you posted it and I was super, super pissed that you put it online. <laughs> it's a, uh, you saw it right. And it's a very good fake against players that like to watch and are really good in watching. As you said, sometimes normal fakes don't work against very good players like Fabians, like Theo, like from Poland. You need to do a bad fake so that he thinks, ah, okay, that's this fake again. I know it already. And then do the other, uh, like do another fake or do the opposite that you usually do with this fake. And yeah, that's what I tried to do in, in this sequence and it worked. Cool. Uh, would you recommend fakes like that to like a, to a hobby player, somebody who is playing against people who probably don't have perfect vision and perfect accuracy? Do you think that they should do that or should they just stay stable and have better footwork? What do you think? Where, where do you start? At what level do you start implementing fakes and then double fakes on defense? I think it's always important to know your opponent. <laughs> If you know that he's watching at least a little bit to the other side of the court, you should definitely fake him. Also in, in amateur level or in beginner level. I think the fake I played there against Fabins, it will not work against hobby players because few only few players have such a good vision that they can that they will fall for this fake. But like a normal easy fake, I think it will work on all levels if the opponent has the ability to, to watch the other court. And there it's important to serve your opponent also in warm-ups and, and in the first couple of rallies and also to judge in what kind of situation he's in attack. If he's in trouble, if he's under the ball, he will not see you, so you don't have to do the fake. But if he's in a good position and you see, oh, he's, he's very good at the ball and he has a good timing, then he probably will take a look and then that's the moment where you can, where he, where you can uh, play the fake. Okay, so I think that's important for everybody to understand because they might think that they should run a fake or they should run like a four or a three. And what you just said, like, if they're in a bad position already, if you serve them and they got a terrible pass and the set's not good, don't worry about the fake because they're not going to be able to see it anyway and they're not going to be accurate anyway. But if somebody has a perfect pass, a perfect set, and they're coming in and you know that they look when they're coming in, that's a good time to do some kind of shaking and moving back there what, what have you hard? have you always had that kind of mindset as a defender of because when i watch that it, it makes me think that you really enjoy the whole cat and mouse game of attackers versus defenders um i absolutely love that as i and i think it goes back to where i was a setter in college so picking up on that but is that something that you always did or is it something that you picked up as you got better or as no, you started playing at a higher level? No, I think I, I always did it and like to do it. Just as you said, I love this, um, yeah, I like gambling against each other. And for sure, it always depended on who was my partner on the block. Because with different partners, I was able to play different fakes, different tactics, because every partner is a little bit different. But yeah, definitely I've, I've done it from the beginning. And it's really a thing that for me makes each level so enjoyable. And 
it's the same thing for me in offense. When I go up for attack against a good blocker, it's the same, yeah. Sometimes it's a gamble. Will he reach in? What will he do? Will he fake me? And so this one-on-one -on -one situation is, is always cool, I think. I like that you talk about one-on-one -on -one situations. And I apologize, guys who are like ready to watch volleyball. But uh, if you want us to, to show more film, we can. But I really like digging into Sandy's mind here. But you talked about playing one-on-one -on -one against the hitter as a defender saying like, all right, yeah, they're different blockers. They have different skill sets. They might be able to touch different things, but you take it upon yourself. It sounds like you take it upon yourself to say, I am going to dig this hitter. My blocker should do their job, but it's me versus the hitter. Do you think about it like that? Like it's you and your blocker, or do you think it's my job to get the dig and I hope my blocker help? Um, or do you say like my blocker has to do this or I can't get a dig? How do you think about it? It depends on the blocker. It depends on the tactic. I think it depends on the situation. But I also, like for a lot of balls or a lot of opponents, let's put it like this, I enjoy to just play a line block, stable line block, and then me versus the attacker. So I try to read him. Will he hit? Will he shoot? Uh, what, what is he going to do? Obviously, when, with my former partner, who was a great blocker, um, we played many, many matches that we just tried to um, to like get his block involved. So we always try to get the attacker uh, into his direction um, because this was the, the, the game where he was good at. So it depends a lot on the situation, on the partner and on everything. But what I believe is that as a defender, you can influence so much. Also, if you're not getting the dig, but you can influence the attacker, what is he going to do? You can influence what the, the attacker sees on the on the other court, and you can also make him hit into the direction of your blocker. How do you make somebody hit at your blocker? Wouldn't that be the blocker's job? How how do you make somebody hit into 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 your partner? Not necessarily, because many many attackers they okay they, they see the block, but they also have the vision of the defender, and they at least for one moment before they attack they watch the defender. So if you just make him a, a believe that you are, uh, for example, running to the line, but your blocker is blocking the line, he will maybe try to hit to the line. So you can just, um, yeah. Okay. Uh, I, I remember Brad Keenan used to talk about that. He used to say like, most hitters will just, if they hit a shot, they'll hit over the blocker. So if the blocker's blocking cross, they assume that the defender's not there. So they go there. Yeah. And you're saying that some people, because they see a defender in the diagonal, they're not thinking about the block. They're thinking, well, they're not going to have two people in the diagonal, so I'm going to rip hard cross. And by you sitting in the diagonal, right. you're encouraging an attacker to hit diagonal. And then you can take advantage of that. Right. I've fallen for that and many if, a times. <laughs> and yeah, if, if I'm staying stable in the cross court and not moving at all, um, he will be more confident that the blocker will not reach in. But if he sees me move in the last second, he will still think, oh, maybe the blocker will also reach in or jump in. So he changes his shot. So it's it's all a part of the of the game, yeah, of, of the fake. I never thought about, mm, maybe I have in moments, but to, to say like, I am going to make the hitter hit into my block. I always rely on my blocker to be like, make him believe something, dude. Make him. <laughs> I never took it upon myself to do that. So um, I, that's really smart. Okay, so here's Damien. Uh, do you consider it? So this is a good sideline serve. But this, um, you said that you were serving deep and then middle. So why did you change? Oh, this was the wind, right? Yeah, right. Um, first of all, there was, it was, there was a little side wind. And also during the game, we kind of changed the tactics a little bit. We uh, went more to McHugh, to the big guy. Anyways, when, when the big guy served, we are not playing so many second balls. So everything changed a little bit in, in the course of the game. Okay. And it was super hot. I remember everybody else saying it was so hot. So if you serve that big guy who's running and blocking every time, it's going to be harder for him over time, right? Yeah, it, it felt for me the whole game that it was a battle um, between my blocker and, and their blocker who will survive in the end because it was really tough for both of them. And in, in, the, in the 
deciding moments of the sets. It was me against Damian in defense, uh, and whoever made more big plays won the match for, for his blocker, kind of, because we were fresh, we weren't served. I don't know if we, we're going to watch the, the end of the second set, but at the end of the second set, um, he made the big plays, and that's why they won the gold in the end. Yeah, it looks hot. The blockers both have their... Yeah, Jesus, look at this. <laughs> yeah, they, they were just... They were just trying to to get away with the with their side out, and it was really upon me and Damien, up, up, upon the defenders, to make the winning plays. And yeah, I failed this time, unfortunately. We all we all do, man. But you have succeeded way more than ninety nine point nine percent of volleyball players in the world. So yeah, and well, failing and still getting a silver medal is not too bad. Yeah, right. <laughs> Most of the time when I fail, I just have to get go for a beer. <laughs> yeah, guys, we want to make sure that you guys stick around to the end. For all live attendees, we always do something really special. So today is April 7th, and uh, we want you to stay to the end because we always offer great deals and discount specials for anybody who attends live. So uh, just in case you're thinking of bailing, like go to the bathroom, but come back quick. Make sure that you're writing this stuff down. Like write as much stuff down as I'm writing down here, right? This is like... Get yourself going, because uh, this is school. Here. And if you're going to have a question, go ahead and use the Q&A. All right, so we're serving. We went back to Damien again. So went back to the defender. It's kind of a middle-ish serve, so maybe it might have been a miss. Um, and here's the defense. So when you're playing defense after your serve, do you go directly to the middle? Do you go close to your call? You know, what's your first thought after you serve or like while the other team is passing and setting? Where do you stand? Depending on the tactic. Um, I, I didn't watch too much um, video of myself lately, but um, I would be surprised if I move the same way with different tactics. So I think with every tactic, I move a little bit different from the beginning. Um, in this game, as we played mostly line block, I think... And it was very hot, so I was for sure a little lazy. So I think I just walked into the cross court and uh, started to camp there. Yeah. All right, so going into saving energy because it's hot, going just straight into the diagonal, sitting near there for a while. Yeah, it, we did also didn't have the plan to fake a whole lot. So um, I just uh, yeah set up there the defense and tried to dig the hard win ball. Yeah, that was just a replay by them. All right, so serving middle again, trying to stop them from going on two. But, oh, what happened here? Overpass. Good fake. My video is a little slow, so. Okay, I'll slow it down a little bit here. Might have contacted that. That's a great dig by the blocker, by your blocker. Well, uh, what's your blocker's name right here? Christoph Dressler. Oh, this is Dressler. Oh, that's right. That's right. Okay. And you played with Seidel for a long time? Me? Yeah. 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 How many years did you play with Seidel? I think seven. Seven, and he's who you went to the Olympics in 2016, right? Yeah. How did you get to the Olympics? Was it a continental qualifier? Were you top 16 in the world? What happened? Uh, no, we, we won the continental cup in Europe. So um, for those of you who don't know, there's a few ways to qualify for the Olympics. First of all, no matter what, no matter how good you are, even if Brazil has the top 15 teams in the world, you can only send two teams per country. Okay. Um, for most teams, you can get an automatic uh, bid to the to the Olympics by winning the world championship. So that's one spot, right? And then you also have 16 spots that go to the top ranked Olympic qualifying teams. And then there's a few other qualifiers because the host country, no matter what, they always get one team in. And then you won through a continental qualifier. So can you explain that? Yeah, it's, it's kind of like a Davis Cup system. Uh, countries play against countries. And for every continent, there is one spot that you can win. And we obviously had to play in Europe, um, what's by far the toughest continent. And uh, we were in the final in Stavanger with uh, 15 other nations from Europe. And we just played single elimination, elimination country versus country. Uh, first round, we, we played Latvia. 
Second round, we played uh, Turkey. Third round, we played Russia. And then in the final, we played Belgium. And, uh, it that was, was a uh, single limb tournament. That's, that's a minefield of good teams. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And we, we avoided Germany and France that were on the other side of the draw. Mm -hmm. um, so it was really stacked with very good teams. Um, and our, our main goal there was to be top three because the second and the third place team, they would go on to the World Cup uh, to play for another spot. And at the World Cup, we knew that the competition wouldn't be so strong, like still strong, but um, not as strong as in Europe. So we were hoping for a good draw to become, to be able to get to the top three. And uh, we weren't lucky with the draw because in the first round, we met Latvia with Plavins. And it was probably the toughest matchup um, the whole tournament. And we, we went into a golden match because it's always like two teams per country. Mm -hmm. uh, number one team plays against number two team from the other country. And our number two team uh, plays against the number one team from the other country. If these matchups end up 1-1, one -one, um, there is a golden match and you can send anybody you want. And we, we played the golden match against Slavins and I think they had four match points and we beat them I don't know if, if it was 2018 in the third set or 2220, something like that. So it was crazy and yeah, oh, man. everything went right for us. So, yeah. Sick. First round and then the three more rounds. <laughs> God. Man. Um, okay, so. Definitely dramatic. <laughs> it's yeah, it it's was. hot there. It's really hot and you're still choosing a jump surf, a jump float surf. Is that because you believe like so much in the importance of service pressure or just you don't want to you know to me i would like you know i have to make a conscious decision like <laughs> all right it's this hot am i gonna jump right now or am i gonna like get the dig and have enough energy to side out so what, what was your mindset first of all service pressure i believe that service pressure is the most important thing um always <laughs> um so this would be the last last thing where i save energy at, at, uh, on service. Hmm. Secondly, I wasn't served, so I was actually pretty, pretty good and pretty fresh still in the first set. So I didn't think about that uh, too much. I think I cannot remember any time in my career where I had to stop uh, jump serving because I was out of power. So I think I never changed to standing float surf. Also because when I play standing float surf, it has to go up from my hand to cross the net. So. <laughs> Okay. It won't be very effective, yeah. I almost never play a standing float surf. But if you're a tall guy um, with a good reach, um, why not choose the, the, the standing float surf, especially for blockers that have to run in front too. Okay. Uh, I think uh, it's not a bad option if you can put pressure on the team with it. Like it. All right, so right here, you get Damien in trouble. This is a bad pass because it's half quarter behind. And he's a right side player, so good serve. He did the job. Now that he's, we call this out of system, it looks like you had a line block and a diagonal, but it looks here like you stepped forward. Was this intentional or was it just in the moment? Um, I think I was, I was uh, expecting a middle hit here. Um, so I was stepping a little bit inside. Also because of the wind, because this was the tough wind side for him to to hit it um, in the diagonal. And also, I think I was paying a little bit of attention to the line shot here, because as you said, I thought he's out of system. Maybe he will try the shot against the wind here in the corner. So that's, I think, why I was stepping up and stepping inside a little bit. Okay. I was just, I was giving up the hard driven ball cross court because I thought it's the toughest ball he, uh, that he could play. But I think, yeah, he scored it, right? Yeah. Yeah, uh, it hit like the last six inches of the court, but. Yeah. That's interesting. Okay, so the wind's on his right side, so it's blowing yeah. it this way. It sets like this, it's on his left shoulder, and you're like, yeah. if he's going to hit this hard cross, he's got to be really big and hit really sharp because the wind is going to take it out. So you decided that should be eliminated, so I'm going to step up and play the shots. Yeah, it, it was, from, I think in that moment, it was a percentage play. I thought um, there's a high chance that if he goes for the cross hit, that he maybe might make a mistake. Um, and it's for sure a comfortable shot for him to go against the wind or um, into the middle from this position. So I wanted to cover these two parts. Okay. 
Okay, so they get the dig here. And yeah, so they get the dig and you just go right back to your diagonal position and you get really stable. Yeah, as I said, in this game, since we mostly played line block and didn't fake a lot, it was easy. But um, in other matches where we play more tactics and um, more variety, it's one of the most important things that after the other team digs you, to get back into position very fast. Because if you're not fast enough back, you cannot play another fake against this attack out of defense. And it's even more important out of, to, to defend well against this attack out of defense because he will be in a tough situation and it's very important that you don't give him an easy opportunity to score this ball, to put this ball away. So make it hard for him to score this ball out of defense. Okay, so the other team digs you because they're in transition. They're like out of system a little bit. You have a better chance of digging the next ball than you have any of the balls before that. So you say like, I have to get back immediately so that I can, if I need to, so that I can fake and lead him into me. Cause now like as the longer the point goes on, the better chance you have of getting a dig each point. Yes. And also out of defense, when you're out of position, you often give away an easy opportunity for him. For example, you're not all the way back. He sees you. Ah, no way. He's going for the line shot. But he can make him. He has an easy solution for him. If you take away this easy solution, he will have to risk more. Maybe watch a little bit longer what you're doing, and so he will tend to. Uh, there's a higher chance that he will make a mistake or uh, not not such a good play, like not such a good shot or, or hit. I I think that that's a a really good thing for listeners that are kind of new to the game that don't think or don't realize how important it is for your defense to set up a system because like a lot of a lot of people that are just starting off they just hang out in the middle of the court and they hope that a ball gets hit at them um, but what what you've done with that situation by pulling off the net and getting into that cross court is you is you've given that attacker an idea of what he thinks he can do to score right and now you're with that cat and mouse game again, now you're back in charge of kind of giving, going back to that percentage talk of being like, okay, this is going to be his more high percentage shot. This is a less percentage shot. And then that's where the defensive setup kind of comes into play. Um, I think that that we, we have that trouble a lot uh, with coaching and we run into a lot of people that are like, I'm not a blocker. I'm not a defender. What do I do? And that I, what you just explain there, I think it's very, very important. Yeah, I mean, how many times do you see like an, an A-level player get dug, they look at the dig without moving, they look at the set without moving, and then like, oh crap, I have to go play defense. Yeah. By that time, they're just struggling to get back to position, no less like trying to get a dig. Now they're fighting to get to position instead of getting a dig, like Dandy said. Right. So huge huge hugely important lesson there guys like that's where that getting caught in no man's land if you don't do that that's when you get caught in no man's land <laughs> Absolutely. yeah I, hustling back on defense is like so important in so many sports and that's people forget about that in beach volleyball like they just kind of sit and watch it's like get the, mm -hmm. get the <laughs> right yeah it, it always reminds me a little bit on, on basketball if you don't go back in defense after you get back it's like giving up an easy layup in transition in basketball instead of hustling back and at least fouling him or whatever, or putting a person between him and the basket. So, yeah, just don't, don't make it too easy for them to score out of defense. I've never thought about using that analogy of getting back on defense playing basketball, but it makes perfect sense. <laughs> All right. Here's a loopier serve going attacking the big guy. I mean, this is a huge spread for them. This is, I mean, their offense is pretty unique because this is a lot of distance between them. McHugh is going here and attacking the antenna, and they like to make these big, hard swings. So I can see your shadow here. Usually you've been setting up in a line block. That's what it looks like here. So you're, you're in the cross really early. Okay, just, just in front of maybe one foot on three quarters depth, but really, really, really stable here. Yeah, I think on, on that play, I was actually a little bit too much in front. Um, I think the, the plan was to, 
to cover the, the long cross court and the middle, depending on, on his position. Mm -hmm. And I think I, ha I could have stayed half a meter more back. Okay. Um, and Zandy, I got it. Mark, would you mind going back to the beginning of that play? Yeah. yeah. Um, so I'm sorry, but I forgot your blocker's name again. Um, where he starts off, and I'm sure you guys had this conversation with a spread offense like this. Why, why didn't he just go stand on the line? Because of the second ball. Okay. Yeah. So, so that's, that's why he, can you kind of walk us through what the idea is there? Um, I think first, first priority for the blocker um, has always to be, where's the pass going? Is the pass coming close to the net or is the, maybe the setter trying to uh, go on two? So this is his first priority. And afterwards, um, he should go fast outside to the hitter. Um, I think in this case, he could have reacted a little bit faster because the pass is quite far off the net. But I think it is definitely right to focus first on where the pass is going, like the, the reception, um, instead of going immediately um, to the attacker. Because especially if you, if you put a lot of pressure with the serve, um, there will be some receptions that come close to the net and it's always good to be there um, from the beginning to um, collect all these points where the, the, the reception is close to the net um, yeah, or even overpasses. And does that, that help you set up as a defender as well, getting to see him kind of drift out to that antenna and then you can kind of go and get into that pocket? Not really. Or, I think it would be easier if he would start outside and go just straight up so I can see everything, I know where he is and everything. Um, okay. But I, I think it's just necessary, especially um, the way teams are playing right now with a lot of second balls um, from many teams right now. I think it's necessary to, after service, to find the position between the receiver and uh, where the reception goes. And then if the reception comes close to first cover this part, and then go um, to the attack center. Awesome, thank you. All right, so McHugh's hitting again, bad pass, out of system. You're probably not gonna run any any games because they're out of system, so you're not like worried about fate because this isn't a great pass. But I see this move here, right? This this set is tight, and you take this, this big hop forward. Like you don't run forward, but you just jump forward. Can you, was this intentional? Is there a reason for this? Yes, intentional and a little late, I would say. <laughs> I could have done it a little bit earlier. Um, I think when I do it late like this, he will um, kill me with the rainbow shot cross court over me. I will not, not have a chance to react for that. So if I'm a little bit earlier, I can start to uh, for long shots behind me and for the, the other two shots. Um, what what uh, my philosophy is for close balls is that the blocker tries to cover the ball so that he cannot play fast balls beside him. So fast balls down, like a fast cut shot or a fast slimy line shot. Um, and I stay in a neutral position in the middle of the court and try to run everything that comes over the block. So this is this goes back to you saying like, all right, well, this guy can't hit hard now because it's tight. Right. But you get closer to the middle of the court and you step closer to the net to cut off angles. Right. The most important things in, in defense in beach volleyball is adjusting, adjusting to what is the situation. Although the plan was to only care for the hard driven balls, I can see that it's close, so there's a big chance he will just knock it over the block or whatever. So I have to adjust. And also my partner on the block, he also has to adjust. Instead of just making a straight line block and letting him crush the ball cross court on two meters, he needs to go onto the ball and try to cover the ball. It's always adjusting is so important, especially when you're playing with fakes and different tactics. The most important in-game call in defense is change or give a new signal for a new blocking tactic. Because when you play, when you plan a fake and they're out of out of system right now, uh, you have to change that. Otherwise you give away an, an easy point again. That's huge. That's such a good point. Um, we, we just talked about this. So we posted a, a video that's going like kind of viral right now. It's, it's got uh, posted 2,500 views in a day. But we talk about having a play call. And then when something, when situations show that like that is now impossible, like if you have somebody blocking line, but you know that the hitter 
doesn't have the ability to hit line anymore, stop what they have the ability to hit. Like forget that play call, even though you called it, stay in the moment and now defend only what's available. Like don't stick to your call just to stick to your call. You have that as a plan, but you need to be able to change your plan in the middle of the point so that you can stop what's available, I think. And, and as a piece of takeaway, so you said that on tight balls, when there's a tight set, you have your blocker ditch. There's no more calls, no more line cross anything. They go completely ball and you step forward and hold in the middle of the court. I play really similarly, although I never used to. <laughs> Let, 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 me add, let me add one thing because with, with my former partner we were playing a lot of fakes like almost fake um, and because the teams were struggling after bad reception and so we could use our fakes um, and it took away one of our biggest strength the, the faking so we, we, we sometimes we started to serve really easy so that the, the other team has a good situation good pass good setting so that we can use our fakes again. Could be also an option if, if uh, yeah, if the team is constantly out of system, but making good things happen out of bad situations, and it, it throws your game, your defense and blocking tactics and your game off because they're always out of position. The set is long or the set is short. You you have trouble to adjust. Um, just take down the service pressure and um, try to work the fakes. I've played against guys like that where you're like. This guy kills every ball when he has a crappy pass. Yeah. But like when you just give him this soft meatball, he like thinks, he tries to look, and he's a terrible at looking, terrible at shooting. But like naturally athletic, when his mind gets, gets out of his way, he's an unbelievable beach volleyball player. So you give him the easiest serve in the world, and you like allow him to think a lot and, and try to see you. And you say that that plays into your strength because you're a really good faker. That's an interesting tactic that I think more people can definitely like utilize and say, maybe this is still the right choice going to this guy, but maybe he needs to be in a certain situation where we can get him. And that's like really deeper level thinking. So I, I love that. All right. So this is you staying deep. Okay. Chris is coming in hard. So you stay deep. I think this is where you were talking about, like, that's where you want to be behind three quarters for his hard stuff. Nice dig. Very calm. Hands in front. Good angle. Hey, when you're teaching, this is a common, this is a common thing that I see all the time. Um, players and coaches telling you to keep your hands like outside of your hips and shoulders. And then some coaches telling you when you pass or play defense to do this and then to do this. But then when I watch every single Olympic beach volleyball player, this happens, hands are together in the middle and then they move. So which way do you teach? And, um, and what do you think the advantages to teaching there are? Like, where, where do you tell your players to hold their hands and where do you tell yourself to hold your hands? Um, I think one important thing is to have them in front of your body. Okay. Um, I, I'm not doing it very perfect. I always have my elbows here in the back. But when I teach things like that, like movements or techniques, um, I got a very, very nice lesson from um, Coach Selznick. I think it was the old Selznick still. Um, I had one training in Klagenfurt when I was five or six years old. Um, um, when the, the tournament was happening, the, the, um, the big tournament, the virtual tournament. Um, and he was giving a coaching clinic for all the ball retrievers, and I was one of them. And so um, while in indoor, they always told me, um, yeah, get on the right side in reception, get your right foot in front. On the left side, get your left foot in front. And he just said, do like you naturally do, like move naturally. And I think it's the same in defense. Um, also for me, I, I never got any technique um, um, coaching for my defense. I just did it naturally from the beginning. And um, it has, I think it has to be naturally. And this is your, are your natural reactions. And especially if something works, why, sh why would you change it? Mm. So I think, Technique is not the important, the most important thing. Um, I think I would more focus on the result. And if the result is not there, you can tweak some things and see um, what changes um, get improved results. 
Cool. Um, this is so. This is if you weren't happy with your last defense, you're probably really not happy with this because you talked about your elbows being back. Um, one of my biggest problems that I hate about my defense is I always put like my hands behind my hips like that's my natural position and I know that I have to change it because it gets me in trouble because I don't get my hands in front so for the last two years I've started literally playing defense like this throughout my entire point I'll hook my pinkies so that my hands stay in front as a reminder and that like prevents me from getting to this back position and it and it works as soon as I start doing this like if I if I don't dig like three hard balls in a row I'm like here we go like get your hands in front and right here, you come forward, so maybe you read a little bit of shot, mm -hmm. but your hands are really tight to your body, and they're like crammed here in your legs. Is this a is this a bad position for you? Definitely, I think that's why I fucked up this leg too. Um, yeah, you see, when I react to the ball, my hands are already almost behind my body, so it's very hard to control the ball when it's already past you. You have, you have to try to cut it off in front of your body to be able to control it better. Um, yeah, so not a good good pick for me. Okay, so, so hands in front, hands away from your body on defense is something that we can definitely take away from that. Mm -hmm. All right, guys, we're going to go through maybe three more points, and then uh, we're going to let uh, Sandy have a, have a nice long nap. And make sure that he stops keeping his kids awake. <laughs> um, Terrible dad. <laughs> time for beer and whiskey. Just kidding, just kidding. He's an Olympian. I do want to see some more defense. All right, so this is after the technical, we're on defense. Again, just looks like a straight up line block here. Nice, to, ah, that looked like a pretty good touch by the blocker. All right, nothing really to see there. All right, another defense, jump serving. Going after the big guy again, and this huge outside set again. You haven't changed. They won the first match. They won the first set. You're down here. Did you think, I have to change my strategy right now? Like, we have to go after a different guy? Or is this a long-term, like, he's going to run out of energy. We're, we got to stay on him strategy. I think in the, in the middle of the first set, we figured out that he's the guy to serve. And we figured out how to get points from him. And I think there was one uh, sequence in the first set where we also got some breaks. We fought our way back into the first set and then in the end, okay, we made some breaks again. But this was the, the period in the first set where we, I think we found out how we can beat these guys today. Um, and we tried to play like this the whole second set. So, yeah, so you lost the first set, but you didn't blame your strategy. You said, we're still serving the right guy. We screwed it up. Yeah, because in the first set, we started very bad. We were down, I don't know, 4-1, 7-2, something like that. And then in the middle of the first set, we figured something out. We got some breaks suddenly. We, I think we came back from a big deficit. Um, and there we, we found out how we can stop them. And uh, this was the strategy we tried to continue in the, or we, start, we tried to start with in the second set. And I think it worked pretty well. Um, it was more about our own side of game that wasn't as sharp as it, it should have been. Okay. All right. Um, I think that's important for everybody to realize that sometimes you're using the right strategy, but your execution is not right. And you have to decide, you have to make that in-game decision. Am I going to play better and, I'm, am, and am I going to start finishing these plays or am I, am I not good at, at the play that, I, that we need to defend? So maybe I'm not a good hard driven ball digger. So I'm not going to sit there and continue to try to dig hard driven balls. I need my blocker to step in or I need to make this guy shoot somehow, right? Or you say, I am a good hard driven ball digger. I know that we're down and I know that this guy's gotten three kills, but I'm going to dig him. So let's keep going with this strategy. Um, even though we've lost some points because like I failed at the beginning. So different ways to, to think about that and to be aware of, look at this pretty, this is a big giveaway by McHugh. Every other play, right? He's opened his elbow way more than that. And here he keeps his elbow just a little bit forward. For, so for those of you who are always asking us questions, how do I read? How do I know what what means? 
if we look at all of other McHugh's swings from this match, and you can find this match on YouTube, his arm opened about 12 inches wider than it did here, and he has this quick push release. This goes with, uh, I actually just happened to open up the Q&A, and the first one from Wilson is, how do you read or guess high line or angle when playing against great shooters? So uh, whoever asked that question, make sure you're listening right now. <laughs> And this is, this is one of his first shots, right, Zenny? And, like, you picked this up. No problem. You've been playing only for hard driven. How did you dig this? Was it, did you see it or did you just react? I think it's uh, definitely um, anticipation. Like, I think it's a mixture about, um, of reading and intuition. So maybe I just felt from his movement, from what I saw in his approach, that uh, he didn't have the power that he usually had when he was coming in, or he, he wasn't as aggressive with his approach. And then, as you said, on his arm swing, in the last moment, you can see, instead of going all the way back, he stops his movement going back and goes up in direction of the ball with, the, with his hand. And that's the moment where you can see that uh, for sure a shot is coming, when he, he's stopping this uh, aggressive movement with his arm swing. So your um, eyes are, are focused on his elbow, his chest, his shoulder, the area where he's getting the ball. Where do your eyes focus or do they take a big picture? I think everything. First of all, you have to watch his approach. How aggressive is he approaching? How good is his position to the ball? Then you have to watch, very important, you have to watch his eyes or his face. Is he looking at you? Is he looking at all? Um, do you Did think you say that, that again? What? So you watch his approach and then you watch his what? His eyes. <laughs> oh, I bet that's going to throw a lot of people who are watching here for a loop you want to watch the attacker's eyes yeah. to know if they're looking at you or not okay yeah. either his head if he not his head to, to look or even his eyes if you play for a, a very very long time yeah you can even de develop a feeling for players with sunglasses if they looking at you or not i mean you cannot know it but you have a feeling that if he has a good position you know that he can see you if he's in a bad position, you know that he can't see you. So I think this is very important when you're trying to read an, an attacker, to know what he knows from you. That's, that's the most important. So for those who are watching again, I, I haven't seen this play. I don't believe I fast forward or rewind, but I know a shot is coming here. We haven't seen it yet, but watch McHugh's elbow. Every other one, he got his arms beyond 180 degrees and here, it doesn't even get close to that. So if you're in that moment, you're thinking, take a small shot forward, and now I'm ready to chase because he's not loading up to swing hard. And yeah, he does exactly that. Oh, wait, this is the same play. All right, uh, that was a rewind of the same play, but was pretty obvious because look at the difference in this elbow, right? This is his elbow when he's hitting hard. Take that freeze frame. This is his elbow when he's shooting. That's max extension. That is a monster difference where if you, your eyes can pick that up, you're going to have that ability. And of course, we can see it here in slow motion. But the more you train looking at players and watching video like this with amazing teachers like Zandy and Brandon, right? If you keep watching this, you'll be able to see this in the game because like guys like Tom Brady, NFL quarterbacks, all they do is watch film and video to see what positions and what movements lead to a certain play. And if you guys watch video on your own and you watch with us during these webinars, we can show you these positions. And in the game, I promise you, you'll start picking up on things live. Zandy, how much do you watch film as, as a world tour athlete? How much do you watch video? Uh, a lot. Um, I, during my career, I mostly watched opponents. So to, to uh, find out a strategy or make a tactic against them. Um, I wish I would have watched more film of myself because I think it helps a lot to watch yourself. Um, for example, now that I'm watching, I, I recognize things that I didn't recognize in the game. And it was often the case that um, after the game, I had a feeling ah, I played very bad. And then I watched film and I actually had a very high title percentage. I uh, converted all my digs and also the other way around. So it's very important to get an objective view on your own game because mm -hmm. in game you always have like a different feeling and it's always yeah not really objective. It's I like that. Yeah, I think it helps no matter like what your level is. Um, like you've you've outperformed me in your career, and 
like we're sitting here and, and I'm controlling the fast forward and, and slow motion buttons, you're able to sort of pick up because of where I'm slowing down. You're saying like, oh shoot, like, you know, since he's steering the, the fast forward and, and rewind, now I'm picking up on certain things that I did really well and certain things that I'm like, I gotta fix that. Yeah, like I think for sure, watch your own because I spend a lot of time watching film, but some of the, by far the most valuable practice sessions that I've had in my life have been sitting in a living room with a coach watching my own film and watching film of great players, you know, like you and like Mole um, and Jake and Taylor and seeing like how they move and then seeing how I get that. But those film sessions with other people steering it, even though I, I, I think I know volleyball pretty well, that third eye for me is just massive just to be able to do it. So uh, guys, we do offer that on betteratbeach.com. We offer private video lessons. If you want to go to betteratbeach.com and go to the courses and programs, you want to sign up for a half hour video session, just like we're doing here with Sandy's game. Uh, we do it live. And uh, Sandy, do you guys, do you do any video sessions on your own? Uh, not yet. We just started our YouTube channel with some only programs for kids right now, but we will add some highlights and maybe some, some technical input and technical input also for amateur players. But we, is it going to be in German also, or English? Sorry? Is it going to be in German or English? Not yet decided. As okay. I said, we're just starting it, but as I don't want to mess with your company, I think we will do it in German. <laughs> <laughs> well, then we'll, we'll promote you. <laughs> <laughs> Only if it's in no. German. No, anything you do, man, we're, we're yeah, happy. Yeah, for sure. I just wanted, this is the last thing that I want to talk about defensively. So this is one of the first swings where the team comes really into the middle of the court. And I notice that you step out wider here than you have on any of the other digs. Is that intentional and why do you do that? I think, I, um, without seeing the result now, I think it was the wrong decision. <laughs> Usually when, well, yeah, that's what happens. When, when he's coming more from the middle, um, he's taking himself away more angle. So he cannot, or it's not so easy anymore to hit a sharp angle. So the more the attacker comes to the middle in attack, the more I should also go to the middle um, because it's more natural to hit towards the middle and it's just the angle, the sharp angle gets shorter, so it's harder to hit. Um, so I think it was a, a bad play for me to step up there. I don't oh. know what I think. <laughs> so you're saying that if the attacker is in the middle, if he wants to hit like this spot on the court, he has to be so high and so steep that like most athletes in the world can't hit that shot. Right. So you say like ditch that because if he wants to hit that spot this middle ball it's got to be slower so you can react anyway yeah. so you stay more middle-ish even when the player keeps coming towards you you say like all right but he doesn't have that angle anymore so okay. you would rather stay a little bit more centered so that you can dig this yeah i think in this in this situation my mind tricked myself because i saw him coming in very strong like to the inside and I thought he will go into his approach direction with all he, he has, like the full power. So that's why I was stepping against his approach, I think. Uh, but in the end, it was the wrong decision because he was coming from the middle. And it's just more natural um, to go back there when you have the ball um, uh, inside of your right shoulder. And as you just mentioned, it's so difficult to hit sharp angle from the middle. So yeah, I should have stepped to the middle. You see him coming and your body wants to keep him on this side of the court so that you can dig back into the court. So you want to move wider so that you bring it back to the middle of the court. But then you're like your non lizard brain needs to say like he won't be able to hit that side, even though he's getting further outside me. I'm going to stay here because he's probably going to make an error if he hits there. Yeah, he does a good job with his line of approach and really making it aggressive. All right, so we're going to stop the share there, but we do have a bunch of people who opened up into the Q&A. So, uh, Zandy, you mind staying just a couple more minutes and answering some sure. people's questions? Sure. Alexander, what is your playing weight and what weight do you feel best at? I was always around 65 kilograms. 5'5"? Five, five? No, 6'5". Six, five. Six, six, five. Five. I really, 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 really struggle to gain weight. It really, it, for most of my career, it didn't matter what I was training, what I was eating. I was always right around 65 kilograms. And then with, how do you say, uh, nutritional support, like, uh, how do you say, like the creatine and, and protein stuff, um, I was able to get to almost 
uh, 69 kilograms uh, in off-season, and then after two or three tournaments, I'm back down at 65. Okay, so did you want to, or did you find it important that you got heavier during off-season, or it didn't really make a difference? It was the goal to get stronger, and especially now that I'm getting older, to prevent injuries, to get a little bit stronger and more stable. Yeah, but it's really hard for me, and from the feeling, how I felt better, it didn't change a lot. So, okay. I mean, it's, it's not a big also not a big it was not a big jump between my weight um but um i felt the same um, I a, it was 65 or 68 or uh, what is your vertical touch like what's the highest that you touch the highest that i ever touched was i think 321 321 yeah. somebody do the conversion um convert that to, to feet and inches please go ahead online and, and write it in the chat but 321 centimeters yeah, cool. 321 or 323, something like something like that. But right now, I'm not there anymore. I'm more like 315 right now. Okay. So like 10, 10 6, 7. Not, I mean, you don't have to be a monster to succeed. Like, you have to be technical. You have to be fast. And Zandi already said, like, he's fast and he's explosive. But he's, he's not touching 12 feet, 12 2, like some people touch. And he's still Olympian. Like, so no matter who you are, what, what you are out there, what body type you have, there is a way you just got to find your best, your best you. Uh, Stacy says, where do you aim to dig the ball in defense? And where do you aim? And is that different than in serve receive? Uh, yeah, in, in defense, especially against hard driven balls, you always try to keep it right in the middle of the court. And you try to get it high enough and higher than in, in reception because your blocks are needs more time to come down from block, turn around um, and set it. And in, when you defend shots, it's very uh, specific which what shot you're defending. Because, for example, if you do a cut shot, you, you want to focus on bringing it off the net a little bit. Because usually you tend to um, play it maybe over the net or into the net because you have this forward movement. And so the, the energy you're bringing with your forward movement translates to the ball. So you have to focus to bring it back a little bit. And another mistake many uh, defenders make on digging a cut shot is they dig it towards their partner, what in my opinion is a mistake because it puts pressure on the blocker that is approaching in your direction and the ball is approaching to him, so it kind of um, puts him under pressure. Try to uh, bring it more like straight up or keep it closer to you so that the blocker can approach to the ball for the sets. Okay, so making it land like on your half of the court if you dig it yeah, right, not, right, but right. Not, not towards toward yeah. them where they yeah. where they are as you're big. Where do you dig when you dig a high line shot? Because I, I hear a lot of different theories. I like my players to bring it back to the middle because I, I hope that my blocker has the time to land, get one step off, and then like he's already facing where he wants to set. But I see a lot of people leave the high line dig along the sideline. Where do you teach or try to dig it? I would teach to, to bring it a little bit back to the middle. Right to the middle is maybe a little bit too much, but on the, to the line of the blocker or maybe half a meter, meter behind him. That's enough. I think with all these questions, it's always good to go into the blocker's view or a setter's position, setter's view, and see how does the ball have to fly that it's easy for him to set. That's the first step. So how uh, do you not put him under pressure with the dig? How make, do you make him comfortable for setting? And the second thing is, where do you like to attack from in transition? If you like to attack from outside, keep it on the, your line dig on the line. If you uh, prefer to hit more from the middle or, or so, um, it's better to bring it a little bit more to the middle. Soak it up. Write it down so that you can go back to this. And when we all get back outside again, you can apply some of Zandi's teaching here. At what point, oh man, I like this one. This is an interesting <laughs> question. Yeah. Um, oh, I did want to touch back just, just as you said, like what ball is going to make my setter most comfortable right now? That's going to be tough for a lot of amateur players, I would say, because they're so concerned just with touching the ball first, you know, that they're like, now your mind as an advanced player, you're saying, okay, touch and I need to put it right here because my blocker is there and he's either in the air or on the ground right now. So you're having two minds right there. And I think a lot of the amateurs, where they're at, they're probably just thinking about like footwork and getting a good touch. But as you progress through your games, guys, you also need to be aware of where your partner is and what their movement is like and sensing them. You think so, Brandon? Yeah, make, it's uh, uh, sorry, Zandy, go ahead. To make one step back and to simplify it a little bit, there are maybe two points you can, you can focus on. And this is, one point is play the big high enough so that the blocker has time to set 
And the sec second important thing is the movement of the blocker after his block. This is very important. Um, these are, I think, is the two things that you can control easily in, instead of playing the big perfect, but it's definitely a very, very tough thing to do also for me and for world class players. Um, but you can always try to play high enough so that the blocker has time to go to the set and that the blocker can focus on his first step after landing. And I think these two things are easy to do and, uh, and very important. I think a lot of blockers end up like landing and immediately chasing the ball when they should be immediately getting to a setting position. Right. You know? And sometimes that changes. Like if you only have a fingernail on the ball, they need to come and help you a little bit. But if you're going to get a full fist on it or even two hands, then they can trust that you should have some accuracy so they can go to their setting position and not like just, I call it Labrador syndrome, like get the ball, get the ball, get the ball. Yeah. Like, I don't know. Like he's got the ball, you go to your setting position. Yeah. I think unless you're really, really, really good, it's always smart to get in this, into the setting position, like a, a step off the net, a step to the back, and that's it. The, the other thing that, okay, you uh, judge the quality of your partner's stick or how he's there at the ball, I think this is a very tough thing to do and this is something for a blocker that is very good in anticipating and reading the game and who has a lot of experience in playing this game. So this would be, in my opinion, the second or third step in this project. At what point do you decide to stop pursuing a ball or not pursue a ball at all? Are there any times when you choose to just give something up and not chase it or what? I do, but I shouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> I think more so like you have to be okay with certain kills because you know that your offensive design, like your defensive design gives certain things up. So it's like, okay. And for me, long-term strategy, I'm pretty good with letting a guy get a certain kill like three times so that he has confidence in it later. And that's when I can scoop him. But you know, your mind has to keep stats during the game. Uh, I don't know if you play similarly. Yeah, I think we've talked about it a little bit today as well, where you kind of have to be okay with giving up some shots, you know, like you, you play the percentage game, you put them in a situation where like, okay, their best shot right now Sorry, to guys, score. My down right now. Who's down? We still see you. Yeah, now I'm back, I think. I, I didn't okay. hear the last part. Just saying, there are certain points where you're, so like we had the one play that we were talking about, you thought that he was in a position more where he was shooting, and then he hit that ball deep cross court, and that was kind of the ball that you were willing to give up on that play. That's something that I, I have that conversation a lot with the people that I coach, especially if I happen to be playing with them and I'm a blocker. So if I give them a line call and they're just starting out, I tell them, okay, this means if they hit a ball over me to the line, like that's the ball that I want you to give up. But if they happen to hit a ball hard cross at you, or if they shoot a ball cross, then those are the balls that I'm not expecting you to get the dig, but I'm expecting you to at least touch it, you know? So that way it's kind of, I think that that's kind of a better way to think about that. Obviously it's easy to give up on a lot of shots. <laughs> <laughs> I find myself doing it a lot when I play defense, but um, mainly just because I'm not as quick as you guys, but I like what you said about that. Yeah, an important rule is for sure you cannot cover everything. I think if you try to cover everything, you will really cover nothing. So it's good to focus on, on the place that your opponent likes to do that's often and try to stop that. And if he plays a perfect shot or a great ball out of a difficult situation, you also have to pull your cap and say, hey, nice play. If, if you play not as good as this one, I, I give you. But you have also, for sure, you have to give up some some games. That might be the uh, the eighth sin of defense. <laughs> <laughs> Trying yeah. being upset about every single. Trying ball. to touch everything. Okay, Mike asks next question. Mike asks, what helped you be so competitive in your match against Mole and Sorum? What do you focus on when you watch them? Uh, what helped us most was that they were really tired. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, if we didn't have anything to lose, we played with a lot of risk, especially my partner. He said, hey, just go for it and serve. And it was an easy match for us. They had all the pressure for us. It was just enjoying. And it was just mentally very easy to play because if you have nothing to lose, you can risk. And it happens uh, to work uh, out a lot of times if you don't have pressure. So, yeah, I think that helped a lot. And in the game, as, as I told you in our Instagram live chat uh, before, we didn't really have a plan because we knew that they had lost four matches the whole season. 
um, all four matches against the number two or the number three in the world. <laughs> we knew our chances were not very good. And also, if we would have won that match, the pool player at the European Champs is like that, that if we won, won this match, lost both the other matches, and they won the other matches, we would still be out. So it didn't really matter so much. So we just started the game without really thinking a lot about tactics or so. Uh, yeah, for me, it was just, I wanted to see them play live, like on the court against me. <laughs> was my first time. So fun. you're an Olympian and you're looking at these kids and you're like, I'm just really excited to play against you. <laughs> 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 well, I guess because if the team uh, loses only four matches a whole season, then I want to play them and I want to see it. I want to see how it is to play against the block. And stuff. Yeah, we just try to avoid the block and risk serve and yeah, try to get some easy points with serve. And it worked very well. When you say serve with high risk or serve aggressively, what does that mean to you? Do you serve flatter and faster? Do you try to hit the top of the net? Do you serve closer to the sidelines? What does serving uh, more um, aggressively mean to you? I think with jump float, it's flatter over the net and also more to the sidelines. Like you risk just more to the, uh, the sidelines. Um, and for jump serve, you should serve with more power. Josh asks, uh, it seems like you're still getting better as you get older. How do you do that? I think, first of all, in beach volleyball, you can gain so much from experience. Experience is so important. The second thing that helped me the last couple of years was mindset. Um, because until the Olympic, there was always a lot of pressure involved. First of all, we had this high goal to go to the Olympic. Secondly, my partner um, put a lot of pressure on our team all the time. So when this pressure went away and I could play more freely and enjoy the, enjoy the game more, it also helped me a lot. Yeah, and I think as long as you stay athletic, it, you will get better when you, when you get more experience. In the sport. How do you, so somebody, uh, this is an important question, Wilson, um, is this the one that you picked up on earlier, Brandon? No. How do you side out against bigger blockers? Like, could you give us two, methods or just like a thought process that, that you change based like if there's a bigger more athletic blocker up there um for me personally um i didn't have too much problems with big blockers because um i i used to um, watch a lot what the other team is doing in defense and in block and bigger blockers are easier to to see um, um so that helped me um when there was a a really good big blocker that um, was taking away a lot of space and really making the line shot tough for me. Um, I tried to move him. So move him, play faster set so that he cannot set up his block in a calm position and really pressure you, but so that he's constantly in movement. Uh, maybe if you have to move, you take away a couple of centimeters of his height and it will help you. Yeah, so this will work very well against most of the tall blockers. Do you change where you pass when you want the blocker to move? Like, do you pass like wider or do you run a back set or a quick set? Like, yeah, yeah. This was one thing that helped me a lot that I was pretty good or I am pretty good in controlling my reception, my pass. Um, because in my most successful years, I was playing on the left side. I was always playing my side out in the middle. I was never hitting, hitting at the antenna or outside or middle distance. I was always um, playing right from the middle. And to be able to do that, you have to definitely control your pass. If you try to move the blocker, play combinations, it's very important to have the pass consistently on, on a certain position. So that from this position, you can play all your different fast settings or back settings. And um, you definitely have to pass more to the middle to open up uh, the court a little bit so that you can play the outside shoot because if you pass to the outside and you play an outside shoot and it goes only through one and a half or two meters, it doesn't help so much. Mm. If the ball from the set flies three or four meters, it will make the blocker move more. You're saying that like if, if you move to the middle, does that open up more shots or more hard swings for you when you hit out of the middle? Or does it just make it easier for you to see because there's so much movement behind you? I think both. I think both because um, when you're on the antenna, the blocker can really set up his position perfectly. He has the antenna to, for orientation. He can penetrate to the ball and take away here a lot of angle in the cross court and hold his line stable. When you're coming through the middle, it gives you a lot of more different angles to the line, back to the line, 
and it's so difficult for the blocker to have the, the right position when he's blocking in the middle because he doesn't have the antenna as a reference. And, yeah, and he's got to know like where the corners of the court behind yeah, him, yeah, yeah, exactly yeah, yeah, yeah. where they are and what he's taking up behind him. It's easy right. to have the stick next to you, but when you're floating in the middle, it's like, how much cross do I need to take to cover his swing? Right, right. And plus, the line shot, when you play it from the middle, it goes away from the defender. So the ball is flying away from the defender, what makes it uh, so much harder for the defender to, to do. One thing that, that I like to bring up um, as something to think about, guys, when you're hitting a line or a cross shot from the middle, a lot of people think about hitting over the block and they think about the deep corners. But if you're in the middle of the court and you hit towards the deep corner, there's a good chance that the defender can cut that off sooner. So when I'm shooting over a block and I'm out of the middle of the court, I like to aim over them, but to the middle of the court instead of that deep corner to make that angle just a little bit further from the defender. Zandy, I don't know if you do the same thing or if you want to give that away, but I want everybody to think about th that shot sequence and the angles that your ball flies on, like the path, and how close it is to the defender. Because if you aim for the corners all the time, especially out of the middle, that V becomes very narrow. But if you aim for the middles, now those pathways don't cross the defender. So it might make it easier for you to side out out of the middle if you use the middle of the court instead of all the way deep. And by shoot, you mean poke. <laughs> <laughs> what? Well, I don't like pokies. <laughs> um, OK. Do you prefer squats or deadlifts? Deadlifts, already said it. Yeah, I prefer deadlifts. Squat is a, is a great exercise, but since I'm very skinny and my back is very uh, instable and uh, also I have short, uh, like my muscles are short everywhere on my leg, it's very tough for me to make a deep squat because of my missing mobility. I'm, I'm the exact same way. Like my back, I have uh, two herniated discs everything always falls out of alignment so i have to focus all of my training on keeping my spine in alignment and when i do a lot of like weight on my shoulders it's just not good for me personally because of the way my body is shaped so i like to default to a lot more deadlifts than uh than putting weight on the top of my back or front Plenty squat of people are successful me, with, a, with good squat the front squat also helps me a little bit with the with back on yeah, but also my, like what I think what many rollover players have is the mobility in the, uh, in the ankles is not there for the deep sport. So that's also my problem. I'm still doing the deep sport with high heels, like um, the mm -hmm. heel on, on. I love wearing high heels when I'm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, uh, last question. It's working out with them really awkward. <laughs> um, Eric asks, what one of your, uh, do you have any favorite recovery hacks or anything you do to recover? Sleep. sleep? The best thing and the most important thing for recovery is sleep. Yeah. How many hours do you try to get a night? <laughs> I try to get 12 or 14, but with <laughs> <laughs> kids it's impossible. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, every no, every kid you have knocks off three hours. Yeah, <laughs> no, but it, I, I don't think it's about the, how long you sleep, but the quality of the sleep. Um, yeah, you have to sleep well. And I was lucky all my life that I have always been a great sleeper. Have you ever like tracked your sleep or do you just know that you're a good sleeper? Um, I haven't tracked it, but I know that I'm a good sleeper. When my first son was born, it was in the, before the Olympic season, he was waking up maybe four or five times a night. And in the morning I was waking up and my wife was saying, Ah, he woke up every every hour, and I said, "What?" So I didn't I didn't hear anything. And also, my athletic coach he's making this test with the skin. Um, I don't know how it's called in English, but he's testing the skin fold, skin fold. Oh, yeah. okay. On different parts of the body, and the one at the calf is shows you how good your sleep is. And I have always very good. I've uh, I've always been a pretty good sleeper myself. And I tried at one point I tried tracking my sleep, but it actually made me nervous. Like I started getting worse sleep because I was like worried about the results yeah, <laughs> that I was yeah. going to get and that they weren't going to be good. <laughs> my number one rule from, for all my sports career was when something's working, don't question it or don't, I don't know, don't change it. And so my sleep was always good. Uh, I had never had problems with nutrition or I have never felt bad after a certain meal or something like that. So I just 
didn't focus on it at all because the worst for like today. Should have talked to you a long time ago. Yeah. <laughs> You're yeah. still young. So. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Not that young. Oh, all man. Right. Hey, man, we really, really, really appreciate it. Is there any way, if somebody wants advice coaching or if they're coming to Austria, is there a way that they should get in touch with you? Do you have any, uh, any things that, that you want to finish up by telling our audience how to, how to reach out to you um, or find you? Please, they can all write me on Instagram, just a personal message, or also on Facebook, it doesn't matter. Sometimes I might be slow in responding, but I will respond for sure. Don't be shy. They can ask me whatever, and especially now that I'm all the way at home, I have time. <laughs> so, and when they come into Klagenfurt or when they want to do uh, like a, a training camp in Klagenfurt, let me know. I can help them organize everything. I'm happy to, to help wherever I can. How awesome would that be? If, if anybody wants to go to Austria, Klagenfurt, you want to play some volleyball, or you would just want to like three days, a weekend, and you want to hang out with an Olympian, he just invited you. That's, that's so awesome. And they all should, if they don't know about it, they all have to watch the, some video from the Frankfurt Grand Slam where he was still in place to get a feeling uh, how cool Frankfurt is and a very nice place to go to beach with Well, we really appreciate you coming on, Danny. Thank you so much for teaching us and for teaching everybody here and taking your time. Can't thank you enough. I know that, that I've, I've written down quite a bunch here. And there's so many things that you brought that I didn't even think about. So I, I really appreciate the lesson that you've given both me and Brandon and everybody who's attended. Um, so everybody who's still here, stick around for a second because I'm just going to talk about some awesome discounts that, that we're going to give you for, we're going to leave them open for the next hour. Uh, if you're interested in a training program or if you want your own video lesson, uh, we're going to leave those right here. Brandon, anything for, for Alexander here? Uh, Zandy is awesome hearing from you, man. Uh, hopefully we can get all through this and see you again out here in California or who knows, maybe we'll come out to Austria and see you. <laughs> yeah. Hit us up. If you want us to run a camp, uh, we'll bring a bunch of Americans. If you want to go to Austria and train beach volleyball, write that in this message. Send us now a we're talking. like Mark at volleycampformosa.com. Let's go to Austria, hang out with Zandy and his coaches and, uh, and then we can get some training together. And we can coach the players too. That would be sick. Yeah, it was really cool. I okay. I got to go to um, I stopped in Vienna before I went down to play in the one star in Slovenia and got to train with uh, Thomas and shoot. Uh, no, it was uh, another. It was a def another defender. He's been more Moritz. I'm blanking right now. He's doing quite well, but yeah, it's an amazing place, amazing people, amazing cities. Uh, everything is amazing out there. I love love what you guys are doing. All right, Danny, have a good night, and uh, we'll see you another time. Hopefully, we can have yeah. you again soon. That was great. Yeah. Thanks Get for some having rest. me, guys. Yeah, good have a good you. night. Bye. So that was pretty cool. I got a lot out of that. How he's thinking, some of the some of the ways that I thought about it. I was like, okay, he's doing what I do. Like on short balls, he moves in and he gets stable. Where I know that a lot of players charge the net when it's tight instead of right. hopping forward, holding, like staying that, stable. Yeah. yeah. His mindset of getting an attacker to hit into my blocker when I'm not the blocker. I saw a light. I saw a light bulb go off in your mind when that happened, and part of me was actually so happy to hear him say that and see that reaction because I've been that blocker so many times for you. <laughs> I'm ready for you to start doing some work. I need you to start making me look good. <laughs> but you know what's gonna happen? I'm gonna juke back there. You're gonna get a block, and I'm gonna start pointing to me on stadium court. <laughs> I am completely okay with that. <laughs> I'll let you have all the celebrations. Cool. Zandy said, if we have any more questions or any of your questions haven't answered, go and find him, follow him, and ask him those questions um, on Instagram. But, uh, guys, you, you saw just how much that we all got from each other doing a video lesson together. And we've been offering this for over a year. Um, we're good at it. We're experienced at it. And I promise we can bring you a ton of value and normally these are $60 for a 30 minute session but for the next hour because we are working on a lot of other parts of our business so I don't want this to get flooded but take advantage it's $30 for 30 minutes you get a private video lesson with a professional beach volleyball player whether you do or you don't have 
uh, video of your own. That's not a big problem because we can also train you. First of all, we can train you in lifting. We can give you a 30 minute talk about what you should be doing during this time to prepare. And all of your questions that you have for beach volleyball, I wish I'd started these webinars before, uh, before we were in this position because I was like, there's so much that I'm learning just by talking to somebody for a half hour, an hour, two hours. We're so lucky to have Sandy there. And I think that, guys, if you're looking for the next level, and if you're here, there's no doubt in my mind that you're looking for the next level. I'm leaving this open for an hour, so it's going to close down. Sorry, it's going to close down at 3 o'clock my time. But you get a video lesson with me or Brandon for 30 minutes. We can talk about whatever you want to talk about. We can use whatever film you want to talk about. So I've included that link right there. I'll include it again. And yet again, yeah. because we believe in the 60 day strength and conditioning program, um, we know how much it's working. And me and Brandon just reset it and we're restarting our 60 days. Um, we're doing the exact program that you're doing. It is our off season program. That is also 50% off. Um, so 40 bucks for a 60 day training program with every single exercise rep set laid out for you with video demonstrations. There's no yeah. reason for you not to get this program for $40, which is the price of like half a month at a gym. Yeah. And you get that access to us. Uh, I mean, I'm, are you doing day three today? Uh, yeah, I'm on day three today. Yeah. So you're on day three today. I'm doing day three tomorrow. So anyone that gets it right now, especially if you start right away and you get it right away, then you're going to have those firsthand questions, fresh questions for Mark and myself where, we can answer those questions very, very honestly because we just did it. I think that's pretty big. Um, yeah, as far as lifting and the video analysis go, um, you know, I think Zandy talked a lot about his lifting mechanics and stuff like that and how important he thought getting strong in his lower body and his upper body are for his game. And then also with his video analysis, the one he said, I don't know the exact quote he said, but he said he wished that he had done this more, you know, like that's the one thing that he wished he had changed in the beginning of his career is he wished that he had watched himself more. You know, he watched, he said that he watched a lot of other people play. He always analyzed other teams and that's pretty easy, but um, yeah, sitting down, especially with somebody that can, that can help you and, and analyzing yourself, that's where growth happens. Um, it's, I, I think that, that's coming straight from an Olympian and um, his ability to say that and think that is it's reassuring for us. Yeah. I'm, I'm happy that you picked up on exactly that. Um, <laughs> Cause that's like, we don't, we don't have to sell video, right? Like mm -hmm. people who are the best players in the world, they are telling everybody how important and how crucial it is to their success and that they might've been more successful if they had been able to watch more video or they just made that choice. Right. And currently right now it's, we've, <laughs> we, we've been here for over two hours. That's four video lessons. <laughs> so we know that you're willing to sit on a computer for this long. You might as well be able to walk away knowing you're going to win some more points. All right. Do you guys have any other questions for us, for Brandon and I, before we sign off, you have now 49 minutes, 48 minutes um, for the 50% off of these private lessons. I expect that a lot of people are going to jump on this and Take advantage right now. It means that our schedule might get a little bit backlogged, but um, that is fine with us because we want to introduce you to the power of video and video private lessons. Um, and of course, we want you guys to have a program that is going to work for you. If you were here with Sam Pedlo, you know firsthand what he said, right? Another guy who should be going to the Olympics. He said that when I was lifting, because I wasn't lifting for volleyball, I didn't have a volleyball specific training program it hurt him, right? It got him to a certain weight, but as soon as he made the shift to training for volleyball, like a volleyball player and changing his exercises, that's when he saw the biggest jump in his career um, in terms of performance and in terms of the way that he was like moving uh, and able to, to jump high and, and hit hard. So yeah. it's specifically designed, you're doing the same workout routine as AVP players. There's no reason for you not to invest in this. You cannot give me the excuse of you have no time. You cannot give me the excuse of it is too expensive. $40, which is less than a month membership at any gym, and you get to get coached and do the exact same program, and you have contact with professional beach volleyball players 
We're going to help you and guide you through it out. I just went through a 20 minute phone call, a video call with a young lady who she didn't know how to do certain exercises or how to modify them because she had some of different equipment. And I sat on the phone with her for 20 minutes and I said, this is how you do this. This is how you increase deadlifts. This is how you do squats. That's where the band uh, video came from. It was from her calling me and me showing her like, ah, okay, so you don't have all of the equipment. You have most of it. That's fine. Let me show you how to do the rest of the exercises. I designed the strength program. So um, I am a, just so that you guys know my background, um, I've had over seven different uh, training and nutrition certifications before I went uh, full-time like pro and coach. So while I was in college, I was exercise science. My entire education was there. Um, so I designed the program. Um, I've been designing programs now for since I was, uh, I guess, 19 years old. I've been designing training programs. And uh, we finally decided to put one online instead of making it custom, which, God, I wish I would have done a long time ago. So, um, yeah, 100% uh, designed by yours truly. Um, and uh, if you would like to see my card carrying resume, service, yeah, <laughs> I'd be happy to send that to you. Um, but yeah, uh, that's it. Any other questions? A lot of people still hanging around two hours and 15 minutes later. Well, I guess for the, even though we are pros and we, we do this workout program, like I've seen people who are 14, 15 year old kids that are doing this workout. And I've also seen people that are 60 plus doing this workout. You know, there's, there's definitely variations. Um, Something that I normally don't think about when I'm thinking about a good workout program is all the little stuff like the hip health. Honestly, that's that's probably been the biggest thing for me. I'm I'm pretty strong. I'm I'm pretty agile, but my hip health last season was something that literally made me lose games. Um, and just like so, when I think about this program, and I love lifting. I think the most beneficial thing for me is the hip health and it's something that it's, it's, work. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's something that's kind of interesting. And so if you're kind of interested, but you're not sure, um, we also do a 30 day money back guarantee. So if you're, if you start it and you hate it, let us know. I don't think that'll happen um, at all, but we do have that option. So yeah. Uh, um, how long does it take per day? Uh, Mark is actually going through right now and timing it um, so that we'll have those exact numbers. But I would say the shortest days are probably around, what would you say, Mark, like an hour, an hour and 15 minutes? No, the, the, the longer days are maybe might get you up to an hour and 40 minutes if you're working yeah. alone. Um, and the shortest days are 20 minutes. Uh, but again, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Like the recovery days and stuff. Yeah. You got recovery days. Um, you have a couple of rest days built in, but like on most of the recovery days, you're doing really light warm up style movement or like maybe just some shoulder rehab or just a, a range of motion routine so that you're doing something while you're recovering. It's not just being lazy so that you can get yourself um, on a schedule. So uh, it does change. And we are adding those videos in so that you can prepare the next day and say like, ah, okay, tomorrow's workout is 40 minutes. Okay, tomorrow's workout's about 35 minutes. Tomorrow's workout, I need to save some time because it's an hour and 20. Um, right. So we're adding that in as, as we go because I've got a couple of pieces of feedback from the 130 something people who already have the program. And they said that this is what they want added. So again, we're adding it, we're changing it, we're always making it better. And Michelle, you can 100% do this at the gym or at home. Um, Mark has a garage gym, so he has a lot of stuff that he can do, so he can do it normally. I, the only thing that I have available to me right now is our bands, and I've done the exact workout. Um, I had to get a little creative with step ups and use a chair instead of a box, um, and then had to do some adjustments with squatting with bands and doing deadlifts with bands. Um, but honestly, if you're not big into workout, if, like if you haven't done a workout program before, um, finding alternate, alternate moves for these big lifts is probably going to be more beneficial for you in the long run anyway. Um, and that's where we can talk to you individually and kind of give you those ideas. And like Mark was talking about where he got on a phone call with someone today and um, showed that person proper ways to do things and give them some alternatives. 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna add our our link here because uh, we posted a blog where I recommend a bunch of equipment. Um, and some of it, some of it is like essentials, like you have to have it. And some of it, and I, I tell you in the video, some of it's like, all right, this is good to have, but not a hundred percent necessary. Um, and once you, once you get into the program, you can see like the essentials specific to that program. Okay. So I'm just going to send that link into the chat, but that's, that's a great question. And it's one that I, that we get all the time. Like how much equipment do I need? I don't have much at home. Whoa. Oh, what do I do? So he, this is a video with my home gym. If you want to click on that and save that blog, go for it. And yeah, it, and, and it has a list. The main things that you need, light dumbbells, bands um, that have handles. Uh, if you don't have like uh, heavy weights, make sure that you get power bands. They're called power bands. They're really thick, thick, thick rubber bands. So you have dumbbells that are under 15 pounds, bands, uh, and then some, some hip bands, like the circle bands. Those are the main things that you need. Other than that, you're going to need like a chair to do jump up, uh, jumps on. You're going to need some, a little bit of space. Yeah. That's a power band. What, what brand is Brandon is holding? Um, there's all different sizes, all different sizes. Um, yeah, perfect. And for all of those, yeah, like a squat rack does help. Is it a hundred percent necessary? No um there's modifications if you don't have a chin up bar there's modifications that we can show you so like we said 80 percent of this is done with dumbbells or bands that are that are less than 10 pounds in weight and i guarantee you they're going to make you a better beach volleyball player we're not trying to put bulk on we're not trying to like load you up we're not trying to build big pecs we're trying to become the best beach volleyball players that we can and that's what every exercise is designed to do I hope that helps uh, explain it, Michelle. Last thing, guys, if, just in case, you guys don't want any of these courses, which would be obviously a mistake, mm -hmm. but just in case you don't want those and you still want to support us and you're still thankful that we're giving like free lessons, two hours free lessons um, through our webinars, you can support us through our Teespring account, which is right here. I just included that link. And me and Brandon both got our awesome pillows. Brandon, you want to show them the pillow? I freaking love it. I'm getting it. <laughs> we, we both ordered our own uh, Better at Beach and Volley Camp Promosa pillows. Um, and this account it takes more work out of our hands. And it uh, you can support us with. Literally my favorite pillow I own right now. Uh, it's got t-shirts. So nice. Pillows, it's got hat. Uh, eventually hats. That's my favorite side. Oh, man. Oh. Love. And it's comfy. It's soft. Oh, guys, you're missing out. <laughs> yeah, of course, we, we love supporting. We love getting supported. But mainly, we want you guys to be able to wear cool stuff because it sucks wearing shirts that you're not comfortable wearing. So we want you to wear cool stuff. Of course, rep us. And I know you, you want your favorite style of hat. There's somebody who keeps ordering a very unique hat. Which it's a, Eric very, it must be very easy to throw. And most of all, guys, we want you to get better. We have a very real chance of being the number one beach volleyball website for beach volleyball education. The more that you guys share, um, share our links and subscribe to our stuff, uh, the more you can help us reach our goals. We're helping you reach your beach volleyball goals. We want to become the number one resource for beach volleyball education. Um, and so every little bit of support that goes that way helps us and helps us keep bringing free and some of the membership uh, education as well. I'm ready That's to get good. back to my day, day three for lifting to me. There you go. All right. B, I'll talk to you in a minute. And uh, everybody right. else, thank you, thank you, thank you so much for coming. It's such a fun, it's a pleasure, honestly, to be able to teach and share our passion. Um, so thanks for coming, and uh, we will see you at the next one. All right, see you tomorrow. Bye-bye. <laughs>